and fill it. Welcome to Dare to Dream. This is Debbie Dashinger. The show has been nominated for two People's Choice Podcast Awards for a Webby Award. We're listed in Welp Magazine as one of the top 20 best podcasts to listen to this year. And recently, I won the Coalition of Visionary Resources Best Podcast and Radio Show Award. Thank you all for that and for being on this journey. I'm so excited about the show today. This is honestly one of my favorite conversations. Blue is here today. And Blue's had a journey, a life in a British boarding school, behind the scenes of Hollywood, psychedelics, losing her hearing, and going through a full rebirth into her life's purpose. I'm gonna sit down with this artist, medicine woman, and amazing podcast host, Blue, a little bit later. This show is sponsored by Dr. Dane here and Access Consciousness. If you would like to do the energy work, become a facilitator, or go to one of their classes, go to Dr. Dane here, H E E R dot com or accessconsciousness.com. I'm Debbie Dashinger, and I teach spiritual messengers how to write a page turner book. I also have a company that takes your book to a guaranteed international bestseller. And the third leg of the media visibility I put out in the world is how to be interviewed on radio and podcasts and get massive results. I am rolling out the five-day podcast interview challenge. And I know folks come to that challenge from this show. If you would like to register, it's five short days, 45 minutes every day. And each day you're gonna learn another piece of the system so you can be interviewed and max out to the best possible your visibility out in the world because that's why you're here. You're a light worker. You came to shine your light. So go to debbyd.net slash challenge, D-E-B-B-I-D.net slash challenge. You're going to find out how to get a yes to podcast interviews, exactly what to have prepared, where the shows are, what is the right show for you, how to have your speaking talking points together for the host, et cetera. I show you how to do all of this. And this way you can bring in new clients, sell books, new followers, increase your database, and fill your workshops, your live or online. It's time. I've sent hundreds of people like you through who are being interviewed successfully right now. Go to debbied.net slash challenge. So living a life from limitation to liberation. Today, I'm speaking with Blue, who is a devotee of life beyond the veil. She's a mystic, medicine woman, musician, artist, and storyteller. Blue's curiosity of maximizing the human potential has taken her deep into the studies of the Gene Keys, a technology which has supported her to activate dormant parts of her own DNA while guiding others into their own genetic blueprint. She's been endorsed by Richard Rudd, the founder of the Gene Keys, and her teachings of the profound lineage. Blue has also spent seven years being a student in the shamanic world, studying the Shapipo lineage in the Amazon jungle. She's a devoted student and facilitator of the Earth Temple, Center of Prayer, and School of Shamanic Arts. Blue is committed to learning the ways of the plant teachers and understanding how we can work together to heal some of our deepest wounds. Blue is also the host of the Deja Blue podcast with over 1 million unique downloads worldwide. She utilizes the art of storytelling to take people on a journey into their own consciousness and to activate media as medicine. You can learn more about her at blucosmiceagle.com. And with that, I welcome Blue to Dare to Dream. So great to have you. Thank you, Debbie. I appreciate it. It's so lovely to see you in the host position. And, and I'm usually in that spot. So it is really <laughs> nice to be on the receiving end to witness your genius. And thank you so much for the introduction. It's an honor to be here. Absolutely. Absolutely. I'm so looking forward to girl time with you, if you will. And sort of this profound space that you occupy, I feel like you don't relent. Like you're really on a path and you're chipping away all the stuff that hasn't worked unapologetically and you've recreated yourself. 
So I know when I researched you, I read that once upon a time you battled unworthiness. I know the hearing loss, which is, you know, you're a miracle, social anxiety, financial issues. But here you are over 1 million unique downloads. And of course, that's not it for you. You're so much bigger. True Prosperity, successful podcast, speaking on stages, choosing to be all in on transformation. That's so beautiful. It's so inspiring. What was the what do you attribute to this massive turnaround? Were there reference mm -hmm. points along the way where you went, not this anymore, this, not this anymore, this? Mm -hmm. Well, first and foremost, you've done your research and I'm really grateful for that. Um, I, it feels nice to be able to be in spaces that uh, you've done a little bit of digging to understand the context of, of what one has had to go through to truly become who they was always meant to be mm -hmm. uh, before they were told who they are and then sort of got a little bit disconnected from that truth. And um ultimately it hasn't been one thing like you said like there's been many things stapled along the journey that has gone hold on this is actually whose story am I playing here right mm -hmm. because the moment that we're born we're given a name we're given an agenda we're given a, a family we're given a religion maybe we're given a social background or an economic um establishment and so we become these versions of ourselves that we are projected onto by others of going oh okay so to be human and to be successful then i must be this version of myself or to get external validation from my parents or my peers then i must be this version of myself or what does it mean to be a good girl well i'll be this version of myself mm -hmm. and then what happens is is when we live a life from outside in as opposed to inside out we actually start getting a, a shift of a couple of degrees to the right around our authentic nature and it's only in our authentic nature can our genuine service to the world be created. And so, and what I mean by the outside in as opposed to the inside out is going, oh, okay, well, I get validation when I show up a certain way. So when I get validation, that feels good for me. So I'll do more of that. As opposed to going, this feels really enriching for my heart, my soul, and my spirit. And it's actually doing no harm to anybody else. So I'm going to live from that place instead. And so a lot of us are conditioned to live from outside in, which can lead us into this position where we're in our 40s and we're going through a midlife crisis because we become massively disconnected from who it is that we really are. Or we start to actually get quiet and listen to the things that ignite us from the inside out. And so there's been many things on my journey that has contributed for me to start asking deeper questions. And I, I like you said in the bio, I would say that the big staple pieces for me was um, working with psychedelic medicine, um, specifically ayahuasca and magic mushrooms, uh, psilocybin. Um, and they have int introduced me and invited me into a different perspective around what is. Um, and I can totally unpack that in itself. That's a whole podcast in itself. Um, and then there's also, uh, I say the Gene Keys was a really, really deep study. Um, and we, we talked about that also in the intro. And that is um, an incredible technology that helps us be able to break down essentially the blueprint of what we came here to bring into the life, this life of what essentially what the planetary alignment was. The moment we ch chose to incarnate into this life and recognizing that all of the information, all of the codes, all of the insights of who we are is predisposition in our genetics. And so when we can understand the context of the superpowers and also the super challenges that we come in with, then we start to understand from a level of self-awareness how we navigate this world based off of a place of enrichment as opposed to depletion and so that was another technology that really sparked something for me um, and then I would also say that um, just the greatest ceremony that there is which is life that has led me in such interesting fascinating situations of heartbreak and breakdowns and to breakthroughs and being this very curious being that doesn't settle when someone just says to me well that's just the way that it is I just have this sacred rebel in me that's like, yeah, but why? And is anybody actually questioning if this is actually supportive for us as a collective? Um, and so it just led me on this path of going, all right, fam, I want to peel back the layers. I want to see what's going on behind, behind the facade, behind the illusion. And once I can find that place of genuine power within my heart and my being, once my cup is so full, 
there is no other option yet left but to empower others into their own greatness too so i believe that this is a collective thing and we've got to be in this together and so to the moment that i take my last breath i will be empowering individuals to believe in themselves with my whole heart and soul whatever that looks like and um, i believe that when women and men and everything in between and and all of sentient life becomes empowered in their own way we will have a revolution on our hands we will have a different world mm. for our children and our children's children and it feels like a sacred responsibility once you can taste and experience what it truly means to live an empowered life mm -hmm. absolutely and i love this shift you're talking about going from what what seems to be right to what you know to be right i'm i'm recently going through this in the sense that um, I've been called to shamanism since 2019. And mm. I I had many reasons why not. I do music. I thought, oh, this is, this is my offering out into the world. I get it. I do medicine music. And recently I heard Dr. Ab Alberto Veloto speak. And I've heard him many times, but something was different. I've been working with a Peruvian shaman who happens to live in my town, just happens to live in my town. Mm. And watching her do these gorgeous rituals, Peruvian, Andean, my heart, you know, just went like, I want to do this. I just signed up for his six month course. And I'm going to start next February next year. And I, it, it was that t place you're talking about. Who am I? And if not now, when? If I don't follow this calling, which has not left me. I don't need to know anything else except to say, yes, the rest will be revealed as I go forward. So I think that's where creation happens. It's in that moment that knowing that enough of, of the yes, I don't need to know the rest. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm really happy for you that you've decided to follow your curiosity and to go deep mm -hmm. into the path of the archetype of the student. I think that we're forever going through the different cycles of being the student and we become the teacher and then we become the student and we become the teacher and it never ends. And I think that when we can show up as the student in that curiosity um, with the question of, of who, is it, who is it that I am and how do I truly serve on this planet and how can I find more of myself so that I can give myself to others um, and to go into the mysteries of life I'm excited for this six months for you gonna be peeling back layers of things you didn't even know you wanted um, yes. but I'm happy that you're listening to your intuition and it's guiding you in a direction that's going to expand your heart and ultimately become your service one day and be able to support others to, to tap into their truth yeah I believe that's true 100% mm -hmm. heal me heal others you yourself studied under the Shapipo. <clears throat> Excuse me. Can you talk a little bit about what that experience was like? Woo! It was wild. <laughs> I look back on that time in my life and I'm like, this is happening on one side of the globe. You know, like you don't know until you know that like, what is going on in the middle of the Amazon jungle. With was it was it blue? Was it the whole thing? Like you did the dieta while you were there uh, the entire time and et cetera? Uh -huh. Yeah, I did a diet with a master plant teacher called Bob and Sana. And um, a diet is basically where you have very limited um, food, like no salts, no sweets. Like it's basically like a hard, what was it? It was, a, it was a hard boiled potato, a plantain and a little bit of white rice, but completely like just plain. Um, ate that for a few days. Then also just did a, uh, a water fast. And I just had some electrolyte coconut water on top of that. But I did a total of eight days of no food um, and just a little bit of coconut water for my electrolytes. And um, every day we would sit in a ceremony. So there was... Um, one night, Bob and Sana, but that's not a psychoactive. It's more just like a tea. But you start to work with the essence. And because the body's not processing heavy food, because I'm not being overstimulated by cell phones or conversation, I'm in silence. It's really bringing all of the focus back in into a place of stillness and then working with these different plant teachers that have an ability to activate different parts of the brain. And so um, Bowman Sana is specifically designed for activating creative channels, fortifying the body um, and allowing us to, to melt anything that's not in unconditional love back into unconditional love. So she's like a stand for genuine love. And um, so what we did is fasting for eight days 
Um, and then my body is really not processing any foods at this point and everything starts to come up. And then the Bob and Santa tea, you drink one night and then the next night we're sitting in an ayahuasca ceremony. And for hours we have the Shipibo chanting in what they call Ikoros, which is a technology where they utilize their voice to certain chants and they connect it with the medicine, almost like a snake charmer. The Ikoros will charm the medicine into directions of your psyche to start cleaning out your psyche. So the shaman will be sitting there the maestro will be sitting there singing chants into things that he senses in the field so for example we had a lot of people from california in our group and a lot of marijuana in the field and they need to clean the marijuana out of the field because it can be very foggy for people tapping into their intuition and so they have a specific chant where they clean 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 all, all of the uh, santa maria out of the field to do and they speak the ikaros to that space and the, the ayahuasca inside the body will start working with the shaman and cleaning it out of the field there's also, you know, sexual trauma, for example, and there'll be a certain chant for that. And so over a series of 14, 14 um, seven ceremonies, 14 nights, um, they clean out everything, not only in your field, but they'll start cleaning seven generations back seven times seven generations back of things that didn't even start with us but we carry the weight and the memory in our dna or in our bodies on a somatic level so combining the the ayahuasca with the with the bob and sana uh, master plant healer what we're doing now is we're creating what we call plant allies in our psychic field in our psychic awareness so as a facilitator when i'm about to hold the space or i'm about to open a prayer space i will call in in a meditation or in, in just a visualization i'll call in bob and sana who is always now with me as an ally to help me hold the space through only speaking the frequencies of my heart because that's what she is that's what she represents so working with the shipibo they're cleaning you off. They're cleaning the stories. They're realigning and fortifying your body. The master plant comes in and starts to melt everything that's not into unconditional love. In, sorry, that's not in unconditional love back into unconditional love. And so, any time that I was laying in the ceremony and I wanted to be like, well, remember when I was twenty-one and that boyfriend real sucked me over, you know, and my finger goes like this energetically out. Bob and Santa goes, mm. and that's your responsibility too. And she will turn all the fingers of blame right back on me. But while I'm in this place of melting it all into unconditional love, I get to rewrite the stories that's happening in my psychic awareness that is contributing to that staying alive because stories are just for creation. We only tell stories for creation and whether we're telling stories of how much heartbreak we went through and how much of a victim we were of this experience, then that also creates that reality. So the medicine was clearing and realigning the stories in my awareness of why things have happened and how can I actually come to a place of forgiveness, acceptance and softening my body to allow myself to truly heal so that all of this unintegrated stuff that didn't even start with me does not get projected onto my future children and their children. And it takes one person to go, I'm willing to face everything here that may mm -hmm. not even be mine so that I do not pass this on to the next generation and I become the pattern interrupt to the shame and the suppression and the guilt and the and and any emotion that is negative that is still running in the subconscious fabric of my mind and projecting that into a future timeline so the work that they were doing out there was and i use the word magic often because i i, I just believe in magic you know like the, the, these these the, the, the stories I heard from these facilitators of what happens in these ceremonies and what happens out in the Amazon. And I'm like, bloody hell, I'm over in, in America and I'm thinking, do I want to go to the cafe again for the third time today? They're over there raising eagle babies and slaying dragons. And I'm over here trying to figure out what I'm going to wear today. <laughs> I, you know, I also love the story I... I watched your video, your YouTube video that you shot when you were at the Arquette, Arcana, Arcana, um, A R K A N A. Yeah, Arcana. yeah I'm on their yeah. mailing list, so I mm -hmm. I know about this place. And you told this. Well, there's two stories that are really outstanding. The first one I want to say, and it may have been in your TEDx talk too. It was quite beautiful 
I have to say that you t- I told the story about this woman, this healer, this curandera who sat over you and you could see in the video when you had that piece sectioned in the footage of her sucking something out of you right here by the neck under the ear. And you were cl- clearly in pain when she was doing it. And then she spits out this fang looking thing that she has extracted from your body. She faints. And how did you feel after? Did this create a big change and shift for you? That was a really wild experience. There's a little bit of context in the back of that. Um, I was in a ceremony once and I do healing work with people. I work directly on them um, on, on what we call the healing mat and in specifically ayahuasca spaces. Um, and I remember I, I sucked a, uh, like a, it was like so my friend had a, a broken foot at the time and I was guided to like draw the energy out of her foot and she went through this experience where she ended up she was on, walked onto the healing mat with crutches on and she came off the healing mat and she could actually dance afterwards it was a really wild experience and the facilitator at the end came and sat next to me and goes you remind me of a very specific lineage of healers where they suck physical things out of people's bodies and he was like and I was like what kind of things he's like I don't know a whole variety of things like nails were like metal nails to living newts to beetles to bones to rocks like they, they suck out these things out of their bodies and and it helps them like it helps the person heal from the dense energy and I remember thinking oh I've got to see this in my own eyes you know like this is really out there <laughs> but there's just like curiosity like I want to know about what who I share this planet with the most outrageous <laughs> individuals that I share this earth with and so that was when it got first planted in my awareness and then um I remember I went I, somebody reached out to me from Arcana and was like you know I would like for you to come out here and check out this center and so I went out there and um, they said, they, you know, there's, this, there's a healer there who does what they call shantas. And a shanta is sucking out dense or dark energy that has been trapped in the body. Ultimately, it's really just a story that you've told yourself over and over again to a point where it's just stuck. Because and um, yeah. And so I was like, I've got to experience this. And because I was experiencing my hearing loss, I asked her if she would do a shanta um, around my hearing. And she said that they would have one, that there was blocked energy. And so we did a full eye ceremony and then right at the end of the ceremony, like five hours, um, right at the end, she called me up to the mat. I lay down on the healing mat and um, she she starts like swirling her mouth with Agatha Florida and uh, they start putting my pacho is like a, is like a, a tobacco in the Shikapi lineage that, that is a very sacred tobacco for protection in those spaces. And then she latches onto my neck. And I'm telling you, I'm getting a hickey from a 70 year old, 70 year, year old woman. I'm like, well, this is the first I can tell you. I don't know how I'm going to go home and explain to my boyfriend how I got this hickey. <laughs> and she's latching on and she's sucking. And I'm like, ah! And I could feel this like, it was like a ball moving up my neck and she's sucking. <laughs> Like this, and I'm like, whoa! And it was painful. It was sharp. It was really felt sharp. And then she, and then next thing she knew, she goes oh, like this, and she spit something out. And the people come over, and she spits it onto a napkin. And then she takes on the energy of whatever it is that she sucked out of me. So she passed out. Like she was like, oh, and she's like dry heaving. And then she just, and she passes out cold. And they're like, and they're like, don't worry. This is what happens. You know, she's fine. Da, da, da. And then she comes back to, she sits up. She's this tiny old woman. And she sits up and she's smoking a Apache pipe. And she's like, like, fine. Like nothing happened. Like just like the most G thing I've ever seen. And then they take what was like spat out. And they take it and then they don't touch it with their hands because it holds the energy of negative negative energy. And then they burn it and transmute it because the fire is the alchemical element of transmutation. And so it takes what once was a physical thing into a non-physical thing. And so um, when you burn it, it transmutes the energy. It, 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 it dissipates it. So I had this like whelping hickey on my neck. Uh, my a dear friend of mine went right after me and she sucked a beetle out of his neck, a living beetle. It was alive, it was crawling its legs and the whole thing. 
Um, afterwards, my hearing definitely was better. Um, I could hear lyrics and songs, which I haven't been able to hear for about many years. Um, but over the long term, I didn't see a significant shift. So there's like an excitement about it. And I was super excited about the whole concept. I thought this the whole thing was like rivetingly like fascinating. Um, and on top of that, she had done a two year diet. So I just did a 14 day. Diet. She did two years in a dark room on her own. Uh, only eating a certain um a certain amount of food and she would eat this plant called kamalonga which taught her how to do this healing modality so that's how she learned even how to do this um and i believe that it's very powerful i also um as much as i'm in these realms i like to bring a healthy amount of skepticism um into it too because i think it's important and um from my personal experience i was fascinated i was floored by the whole concept i believe in her healing abilities and also i think that to a certain degree a lot of this work is an inside job and if there is a belief that's in place that has created the element uh, originally then that belief also has to be deconstructed because you can take it out for a moment, but the belief may reform it. So um, I think that there's an element of thank you. She's an incredible healer. That was profound. And what the heck? And then also um, I, it's my work to be done. So yeah. I'm still on that path myself. And since you discovered this is part of your lineage, have you been using it more since you returned back? What do you mean discovered it's part of my lineage? Yeah, that you had done this just organically on somebody's foot. Oh, right, I see. Right? Yeah. She came in on crutches and went out dancing. And then, then you experience this. Somebody mm -hmm. says to you, I see this in you. This is part mm -hmm. of who you are. Mm -hmm. Are you using this organically, naturally at all, or not so much? I don't suck physical things out of people's bodies. Um, but I do speak energy more than I speak words. And I think mm. that's been a huge part of my gift of my hearing decreasing yeah. is that when my hearing started to decrease, my natural question is, what am I not listening to? What am I not paying attention? Why is this decreasing? What is it telling me that I'm not paying attention to? And I think that in Greek mythology, you'll see that any, um, any like a seer, like, you know, there's the archetype of the seer that can see the future, that can foresee things that haven't happened yet. They're usually blind because they mm. see better than most because they see beyond the illusion. Mm. Right. So if you also have a hard time hearing, it's actually because you listen or can hear more than most. And it's actually recognizing that 93 percent of all communication is nonverbal. And it's also recognizing that it's not about the words. It's the vibration behind the words is what allows them to land. Mm. And so. That I, I was being invited into a level of listening into somebody's body, into their experience, into the unspoken realm that most do not have access to, which I have been granted access to. So that was where my healing gift started coming online in a really big way was when my hearing was decreasing, my ability to listen was increasing and to truly pay attention to what was going on in the body. So I don't suck out physical things. I didn't diet with Kamalanga. That's not necessarily my lineage. However, um, my gift, that I have been born with and given is the ability to be able to listen to people's bodies and to recognize whether there is distortion and help them come to the realization themselves and move the energy up and out. So it's very, very, very powerful work. I didn't choose this path. I didn't go, I'm going to be a healer in the medicine space. That's not at all was a decision. It found me. Um, but once it finds me, it finds me and, and it's creating tangible results, then I would feel like it would be um, a dishonoring of the gift that I have been given if I wasn't to take action on it. Absolutely. And clearly your soul agreed to do it before you came here. So it would be a great misalignment. So kudos <laughs> that you step in. And I've yeah, got there was some contract or something like I, I right before I came into this life, all of us, right? It was like, right. all right, you're going onto the earth plane. It's pretty dense on there. There's some crazy shit that goes on that planet. <laughs> Are you ready to come in with an awareness that you can't even quite grasp why you have this awareness or where you're pulling this information from? But it is here to help the ascension of the individual's uh, empowerment for the people. Are you ready to sign the dotted line? I was like, all right, let's go in. Come on, let's do this again. All right, onto the earth plane. So I feel like, and I'm not just speaking on behalf of myself, but more so I feel like anyone that feels the call to really genuinely 
be in the self inquiry around um, a deeper level of understanding of what it means to truly mean to be human and how spectacular that is in its own concept. The mystery and uh, the mysteries of what's truly always around us. And then also asking the deeper questions as to why we have done things the way that we have done things and to not continue to perpetuate a narrative that isn't founded on our own truth. So I think that there's, there's, there's hundreds of thousands, if not millions of light workers on the planet right now and all supporting the ascension in their own individual way. And there's no one that's at the top, no one that's the best. It's more so, it's a group effort. And I'm so glad, Debbie, as you being one of those individuals that mm. um, you have created this podcast to be able to have these conversations and to ask these questions and to allow everyone that tunes in to find a deep place of uh, curiosity within their own heart to ask some of the deeper questions. Beautiful. Thank you. You know, one of the really profound things about what you're talking about, your personal journey, when you were coming out of one of your medicine experiences, you had been previously in this space of saying, why me? And I, I really want to hear heal what's going on with your hearing. And, and in case, just so people have some context, this is something that happened to you later in life, right? Mm -hmm. You were a completely hundred percent hearing individual. And then something started shifting. You brought it up around your family. Your brother said, Hey, me too. You both got checked out and found out that you had a genetic disposition. And then you got to a point where 70% of your hearing had been lost and you were living in this space of how can I heal this? How can I heal this? And one of the profound awarenesses you got was coming out and saying, I don't need to. This is mm -hmm. actually a superpower, mm -hmm. which I think what a, what a pivot that is in one's life to own something, to completely embody it. And I think- Honestly, I remember the moment that pivot happened, yeah. literally the moment where I was like, oh my gosh, this is actually a gift. Mm -hmm. um, and I, that was a moment, I think, when my whole life changed. Because again, like I said, stories are for creation. And um, it's really about what stories we place on the inevitable nature of what is. Because at this point, like, I mean, everybody in life has been dealt some really rough cards, you know? And, and we're all going through something that no one knows anything about. That's why compassion is key. <laughs> you know, everyone's processing something that we don't know anything about. And so realizing, okay, well, if this is, right? And there's a mantra that I love, uh, to use from or, uh, a dear teacher of mine and sister Reverend Brianna Lynn she would talk about the most sacred thing is what is so if what is is that I'm my hearing is decreasing and this must be sacred this must have a purpose then I must I really want to understand how is this happening for me not to me because the narrative that I've been playing up until this point is this is happening to me. This is the worst thing that could be happening. And I'm going deaf and I'm in my 20s. What the heck is happening? Um, and it wasn't until I actually read the Gene Keys. And mm. the Gene Keys is always talks about your greatest challenge is also your greatest gift. It has to be for the polarity for it to exist. So if the challenge is, and I, and I read my chart, my Gene Keys hologenetic, it's called a hologenetic profile. And I had deafness in it. And I was like, okay, you got my attention. Watch this deafness going on. What, what, what is this, right? So in the deafness and the shadow frequency, the deafness is listening to the world and being drowned out by the noise of the world and not listening to one's own true self. Ooh. Now, I had to create a physical deafness for it to be like, wake up, come on for me to actually start paying attention. Now, not everybody needs to create a physical deafness, but they can be in the deafness frequency of not knowing to listen to their own intuition, not listening to what's actually going on inside of their own mind and inside of their own bodies and being still enough to be able to really hear the workings behind certain actions that we we um, play out. So I, I read the shadow, shadow in the challenge and then I was like, okay, I resonate, check, check, that's me. Yep, check, yep. Okay, now I have contact. Now what's the power, what's the gift? So there's always got to be a gift and then there's a city, which is this, the enlightened aspect of. And the, the shadow was deafness. The gift was insight and the city was epiphany. And the city is the, the highest vibration, the highest expression. And what I learned in the gift of insight is the ability to have a truth filter to those that speak not of resonance, but just words to fill the space. And when you have a truth filter of being able to actually feel 
the intention behind the words, not just the words themselves. Now you've got a bullshit detector. And that is a powerful <laughs> superpower to navigate through life with. Because people will say all the nice things you want them to hear. And say, oh, well, that's a lovely person. But actually behind the scenes, really subconsciously, they don't have your best interest at heart. Mm. They don't want you to thrive. Because if you thrive, that means that their last line are unworthy. And so that is can be sensed beyond the words if you can train yourself enough to listen. And so when I read that there was a superpower in this, I changed the stories I placed on it. I changed the story from how could this be happening to me? This is awful. I'm going deaf to, oh my gosh, I have a superpower and it is my commitment to put the right frame around this piece of artwork. Okay. I know you do gene key readings, correct? I did. Do? I don't do those anymore, unfortunately. Okay. Yes. Unfortunately, because it sounds, I've done it. I've done the free stuff online. So, you know, and I was able to glean a bunch, but probably nothing like the depth you're describing, because that sounds phenomenal to be I spent able six years, six years studying, studying that book. Wow. Yeah. Before I did a single session, I read that book back to front and I read every single gene key. I read every single archetype that's available to this human consciousness. I read every single superpower that's within every single super challenge. And now when I have conversations with people and they're really in it, they're going through a challenging moment. They don't know what to do. They're angry at the world. My brain is now wired to only look for the potential within the challenge. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I believe is truly means to hold space for another is when someone's really in it, instead of judging them for that position to guide them into their greatness by only seeing the potential. Sounds like the matrix of the gene keys is in you. You don't even need to do a whole session that it just flows through you exactly as you're dealing with somebody. So on the spot, you can assist somebody to recognize mm -hmm. here's what's really happening Here's what you're missing that's really phenomenal. When you step mm -hmm. out of that into this, look what's possible. It's really, it's really just changing the frame on it. You know, it's like, I want to invite you into this different perspective on that thing. And they're like, oh, that actually feels way more true. Amazing. You know, it's really just the stories we tell ourselves. And we think about 60,000 thoughts every single day. And for the most part, they're disempowering thoughts. If we started to actually consciously rewrite the narrative and how we're projecting out into the world, we can truly start living a much more beautiful life. But that requires a level of ownership for all of the areas that we're leaking our energy to that that is disempowering. And so that really is the journey of self-awareness is the transformational journey that we all will get to embark on at some point. I love that you shared the story of having been on Bo Benzana, because now this makes sense. So you do a song and I'd love to know what other songs you do. I am highly aware of your rendition of Serenita Bo Benzana. And as I've shared with you, I'm in a musical group and we do ceremonies and gigs and sound healings and so forth. And we have done a mashup of the original, it's still our version because it always is coming out of your filter, the original-ish Serenita Bobanzana. However, mm -hmm. I love your rendition so much that at the end, we mm -hmm. do the English version, open my heart, find my no. way back home, walk through the shadows, the truth is all I've ever known, into the two choruses, the Serenita and Kura Kura, Etc. Mm -hmm. and back into the English. I we end the song that way because it is so powerful. Sometimes we end our sessions that way to leave mm. people in the silence, the way you take them out without the music, just your voice a cappella. So mm -hmm. it's incredible. And I want people to hear this because you're a beautiful singer. I mean, you've got an amazing instrument, you play instruments, you orchestrated this song. 70% hearing loss, hello, so what, what is possible? How did you hear that version of the song? How did that even mm. come through you? Mm. Woo, I love it. I just, just want to acknowledge, I love the uh, the visual that you just painted of you all singing that and then right at the end you bring in the English and it just makes me so happy that the consciousness of this song has taken itself on journeys that I don't know anything about until you share them with me so I, I'm just super humbled at the power of how this spreads um, and it just really fires me up to want to create more music um, and how it came to me 
I swear the creative process for me is not when I'm thinking right it's not mm. when I'm like trying to make something happen you the creative process is wildly unpredictable you don't know when it's going to come through and so for me I love to have everything that I can create within arm's length so I'll have my paints and my canvases ready to go. I've got all my instruments laid out. I have a notepad and pen if I want to journal. I've got all of the things ready. got all my shamanic tools on my altar. I've got like ready to go. So when the creative wave hits, I could be in the shower and I'm like, -na 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 -na. I'm like oh, that's a cool tune. Maybe I'll put a somewhat lyrics onto it. You know, so it literally would just come in very unpredictable. And how that English came in, I was sitting with a dear brother of mine named Anthony, who um, I did my diet with. And we were just kind of jamming out and we were just playing. And I was like, like singing and playing on the guitar. And I just um, start, carried on playing Serenita, but without the words. And then we were just like, and, uh, and I just started riffing. And it was like, open my heart, find my way. And when he was like, back home. And I was like, back home. Like this. And then all of a sudden, we just had the chorus. And it, was, it probably took us about 45 seconds. <sighs> They still my beating heart. Oh my God. <laughs> really? Yeah. It just, there's moments when those little nuggets just drop in from somewhere you don't know. But like recognizing that, like, I like to see us as humans as also as instruments. So our responsibility is to fine tune our instrument, make sure it's playing well. But what the song that comes through us is actually something greater than ourselves. There's something bigger going on here that is moving through us. Um, and so creating that song too mm -hmm. and the powerful healing impact that it has, I would say that I don't take ownership of that song um, in the sense of like the, the English version. I definitely don't take ownership of the, of, the, of the traditional version that was definitely not created by me. But the English version we're talking about, I wouldn't say yeah, I take ownership of that in the sense of I was more so the conduit for that to come through because I was ready and I had the skill set and the tools that could translate that to be able to allow you to then be singing it in ceremony. In your TEDx talk at the end, you close your eyes. It's such a stunning moment. And I believe you had a crystal bowl and you just started toning. I want to know where, honestly, where does that come from? That freedom that it was angelic and it was mm. so gorgeous and moving. I want to know where does that voice come from? Did it, has it transcended? Did it start one place and now it's become free for some mm. reason? I love that you say that it's angelic because the, the message I got from that one was it's the angel song. And it was when I first found out about my hearing loss and I, or that like what the, the doctors had prescribed me with. And I remember after that, I decided I only had a little bit of money in my bank account and I decided to go and buy myself a guitar and teach myself how to play the guitar because I never knew um, if I was going to ever be able to hear my own voice again and I, nothing was guaranteed anymore. So I wanted to do the things while I did have my hearing left that I always wanted to do. So I taught myself how to play the guitar and off the four chords that I knew, I just started playing that tune and all of a sudden I just started like singing, like toning and it was just... And it was just going through it. And then the messages that were coming through while I was singing was, this is the angel song. Here to remind you, your angels are all around you. This is happening for you as a gift. And I invite you into a deeper level of being able to feel your own voice as opposed to necessarily hearing it. Mm. Because it's where medicine, the difference between medicine music and regular music is where it comes from. And it's in that transformation. It's in that trust. It's in that angelic realm. It is in that belief in something so much greater than myself that that is infused into the song. And so when I would sing that frequencies, my intention was to, through the frequency that I share, is bring you on my own healing journey around recognizing that I don't need my hearing fully to be able to actually feel the music. Beethoven was 100% deaf and he created some of the most remarkable music that still lives on today. And he would put a, a, like a tube or like a cone from his third eye to the piano and hit each key so he could feel the resonance in his body and in his third eye. We don't need to hear to feel. And so it, I started feeling the music. And so when I sang that at the end, that was me taking you on a journey of my, my decision to soften into feeling. And I said right before I sang, I invite you to feel this, don't just listen to it. And that is how it and opens up people's hearts of going, hey, if she's hard of hearing and she's singing like this, well, maybe I can do this thing, right? Because 
what's my excuse anymore? And that's the that's the point of why I share anything on any platform, why I'm here on this podcast, why I will talk on um, a TEDx stage, is not to go, hey, look at me, look how great I am. It's to go, let me share with you the tools that have supported me so that you can remember how great you are. Mm. Yes. That's the intention. And you have said that the intention for medicine music is prayer, not performance. Mm -hmm. It is prayer to you, prayer to your offering, to whom you are gifting this to. That's Mm -hmm. a whole different take on Mm -hmm. delivering music, a whole different space to come from. And I want to acknowledge my dear, dear, dear friend, uh, one of my best friends, Reggie Riverbear. She, um, we were in a ceremony in Mexico and um, she sang a song and it was so beautiful. And at the end, I was just so enthralled by her, her, her offering. And I went up to her and I was like, oh my gosh, that was amazing. You are incredible. I love you so much. And I could feel this like resistance from her, like a little bit like, thanks Lou. and I and I remember at the end of the ceremony I came up to her and I was like what was that that I was feeling that you felt a little bit like when I came and hugged you and she goes because this is not a performance for me I'm praying and in, in, I don't need validation or like mm-hmm. acknowledgement of how great I am because I believe it's important to send it back up because I'm praying with something greater than myself and it's coming through me as a vessel and so I don't need you to praise me as a person but make your offerings to something greater to say thank you for flowing into the space and that changed everything for me I've got a quote from you which is we don't have to sit with medicine in order to heal we are the plant medicine we are the magic what drew mm-hmm. you, you to that idea what what is the meaning behind our being being the medicine mm-hmm. I believe that humans are like giant sponges and we go through life and we have heartbreak and we have breakthroughs and we meet these beautiful people and we have these great conversations and we travel to uncharted parts of the world and we walk down the little markets and we smell the herbs that are on sale and we feel the fabrics and we we absorb all of our life's experiences underneath our beautiful shelves. And once we, we get to this place of juiciness, this aliveness, this excitement for everything that we've absorbed, the seminars, the workshops, the podcasts, the ceremonies, we become so packed with nutrients that we get into a space. I don't need everybody to know about all of the magical things that I've done, but you're going to feel it by the way that I look into you in the eyes. You're going to feel it by the way that I ask you questions. You're going to feel it by the way that I listen to your response. And that's what it means to be the medicine is that all of our life's experiences in the shamanic space exist with us in this realm. You can't see them, but you can feel a nutrient dense human. You can feel someone that's been brought to their knees and had many ego deaths to truly live a life of service. You can feel the authentic nature when someone's listening and when someone's not listening. And so there's nothing more powerful for somebody to go through their own transformation when you genuinely care and make them feel seen and loved and supported and held and acknowledged and respected in their presence you do that it, it, you be in a gathering full of people but you have a conversation with someone that's really genuinely listening and reflects the beauty that they see inside of you you're going to leave that party feeling like a better person because that person is the medicine mm-hmm. what is the shadow side of plant medicine mm. So I think um, I want to extend on that because that was sort of like a little clickbait. Like I I made a video Mm -hmm. online and it was like the shadow side of plant medicine. Um, But I want to extend that. There is a not necessarily a shadow side of the plants themselves as more so that there is a shadow side of us, um, of our relationship to the plant medicine. So um, what can happen is that people will go into the plant medicine space, for example, and get blasted through the ethers of like, oh my gosh, we're floating on a massive rock, hurling through space at millions of miles an hour, held into orbit by a giant ball of fire, and I'm so insignificant and so significant all at the same time. Oh my gosh, I have superpowers, I'm human, I'm operating in this quantum computer, it's so miraculous. And then all of a sudden the medicine wears off, and then you're like, all righty. Well, that was shriek, but I now got to go to my nice man job. <laughs> and I got to go stay in this cubicle. I'd be like, right, I just got blasted out through the ethers. But now I'm actually sitting here being like, uh, well, this is boring. Um, and so here's the problem is that people then create a relationship going, I could only access that state through the medicine. Mm-hmm. 
And so I'm going to keep going back to the medicine to just for a moment, for six hours, experience the state and then go back into my life and do nothing about changing any of it to align with what I saw in the ceremony. So what happens is a codependent relationship is created from these external experiences. Now, the medicine has the potential, when I say the medicine, I'm talking about ayahuasca specifically here, but there's also psilocybin, there's LSD, there's different psychoactive experiences. What they can have the potential of doing is show you the potential of your life, but they will not and will never do the work for you. So that is the responsibility on us to go, you know what, I was shown in the ceremony that I must live a life of purpose and right now I hate my job. So I have to have the courage, this is integration in real time, I have to have the courage to leave this job, to live a life fulfilled, even though I don't know what's on the other side, because this is the path of me integrating what I was shown and who I am to become the same person. That gap right there will never be done by the plant medicines. And so it's super important to witness how we're outsourcing our power to say, I can only access this state through this. Because realizing actually it's only in this sober waking state when the real change happens. It's only in the waking sober state is when integration can really happen. And so there will be the knowledge of the plant that will show you the knowledge that's available. But the difference between knowledge and wisdom is knowledge is a concept, wisdom is integrated. Yes, that's being told something by the divine through the plants which are divine and giving you instruction, don't do this, renege that, let go of this, move into this, coming out with that awareness and then making a choice no, nah, I think I'll do it my way. Mm-hmm. And that's what a, what a wasted opportunity. It is really about leaping in to the unknown and trusting on the other side. There are riches beyond your wildest dreams if you would, will but follow that amazing guidance. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. I know that I've had experiences. It's interesting. It's Well, I guess there has been some gray matter like sacred geometry, the moon speaking to me. I mean, I've had some pretty incredible stuff happen, but mostly it's been just this purge, often this acknowledgement of, you know, all sorts of things and allowing myself the space, the plants, allowing me the space to just heal. And then conversely, the plants have showed up and said, ha ha ha, you have no idea who you are. Let us show you. And that has been profound. Mm-hmm. You know, some of the biggest moments in my life to be able to pull back the curtain mm-hmm. and see my potency, see who mm-hmm. I am, see my, I don't want to say brilliance, but to really have an understanding of the fullness of my being. Mm-hmm. And there is no coming back from that. You can go back into dormancy and pretend life as usual, but there really, you know, the plants live inside of us. There is no life as usual. We're now joined with something so delicious and beautiful and supportive. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. I agree. I love that you're saying that that's the shadow side, being told something, being shown something and choosing not to listen, not to follow, not to explore. I like to think of it like um, if I, for example, if I was in the room with you, Debbie, Debbie and I, and I looked at everyone, I was like, hey, let me show you something. And I showed you this little trap door and we went down the little stairs and inside this room was all these magical musical instruments and all of these treasures from all over the world and all the cool things. And then we come back up the stairs and we close the trap door and now I go, now pretend that that doesn't exist. You would never be able to unknow that that room is there. So once the mind has expanded to possibilities beyond what we know, there's no way we can shrink that muscle memory back down. We can ignore it, but it's going to be tapping away at us going, okay, there's going to be a day where you're going to actually start to live a life of alignment. Yeah, you can try and put it off and ignore it, but it will never actually go away. And so that is the integration of going, you know what? I'm going to actually start living a life with more creativity. I'm going to start living a life where I'm of service more. I'm going to start living a life where I take care of my health and my body and my discernment of the in the information that I'm allowing into my consciousness. You know, there's certain decisions that can start to refine what we call a frequency. It's a frequency game. 
the news, the negative news and te television programming has a certain frequency. There's also enlightening podcasts that have a certain frequency. There's certain places or people that have a certain frequency. And it's about choosing the discernment of going, you know, I'm only going to start choosing that that enriches me as opposed to that that depletes. Mm -hmm. Amen. A woman. <laughs> <laughs> hey, whoa, man. <laughs> Exactly. Well, I know you're speaking at the Conscious Life Expo in February. And for anybody who's interested, I will have the link in the show notes. So definitely you want to check it out, whether you go live, which I, I will be there live. Lou will be there live. Many amazing people, super worth it. Or you can live stream from anywhere in the world. What are you going to be talking about at the Conscious Life Expo? That's a great question, <laughs> because every time I go to plan a talk, I get this message that goes, how many times have we got to do this before you're going to trust what needs to come through? And so I did, I, I did the TED, TEDx talk we talked about before, and um, they wanted a word for word script of what I was going to say. And I had to say to them, listen, if that's what you need, I can't do this talk because I cannot plan what is going to come out of my mouth because there's my will and thy will and I just allow to flow through. So I will create the masculine structure of going, listen, I'll give you a couple of slides, but what happens in between the slides is in the hands of the goddess. So you just gotta like, trust me on this one. I gotta trust myself on this one. You know, but that's actually where I find the magic to be. Um, and so when he was like, okay, what's the, you know, the topic, I think that's important to like have some sort of structure in that sense. Um, but for me, it's more so around the direction of, um, how to actually start setting up a life of absolute magic and recognizing that to be human is to be like superhuman just by being human. Um, and how can we tap into our greatest challenge being our greatest gift and to start living a life from the inside out as opposed to the outside in. So that's the general direction that we're going to be going in. Um, and I can promise you that you will leave the space feeling more empowered than when you went, came in. Um, and I feel very confident in what it is that's going to come through. So uh, we'll see, but I'm going to leave you on the edge of your seat too, just where I am at um, and wondering what's going to actually happen. <laughs> Beautiful. I can't wait. I definitely want to come. I want to listen to whatever comes out of you spontaneously. <laughs> It'll be beautiful and appropriate. And kudos to you for trusting at that level and for being guided at that level. I like that. I like that a lot. And I think the, the audience will seriously resonate with whatever it is you share. It's going to be very now and relevant. I know this. Mm -hmm. Um yeah, for sure. I know your website for folks who are interested is bluecosmiceagle.com. It's B-L-U, no E, like my name, D-E-B-B-I. -B -B it's B-L-U, yeah. uh -huh. cosmiceagle.com. And Blue, this is Dare to Dream. What do you next dare to dream? What are your future dreams and goals? Hmm. I believe that there is a very... Um disconnected narrative that is happening right now uh, on the planet specifically um, for women that is um, founded in artificial glamour over authentic beauty and as you can see in our most of our role models that are in high level of fame um, are having conversations around um, artificial glamour and um, we are I'm watching the the younger generations you know younger girls that are idolizing those and believing that they're inherently unworthy because they don't look like the women that they see on the magazines. And I actually believe that there is a new narrative that wants to hit the mainstream, which is about authentic beauty and authentic beauty is born from how much you love others and how much you care for others and how much you care for authentic in life. And so um, I am currently building out season three of the podcast. We are about to launch and I'm really excited about it. I've already had some like ridiculously amazing guests on um, and that's going to be launching in December, the second week of December. And um, I'm ready to have this season three really become a global name and not because it's about me, but it's about the message that is coming through of empowerment for all people. And I would like to create a platform that I would want my future children, specifically my daughters listening to and going, mama, I want to be the best version of myself. And I want to, I want to live a life of complete magic as opposed to going, mama, my boobs aren't big enough or I don't look like this one, you know? And like, I want to see that energy become the new narrative of what is created 
for how we relate to ourselves. And so I spoke specifically about um, women in the sense of the disempowerment around self-image and how we have been fed into consumerism, thinking that if we get this bra or this outfit or this makeup, then or this hair extensions or this, whatever it is, then we'll be beautiful. But recognizing they're all beautiful things. But if we can sense our sense of self based off of how much we truly know ourselves and how empowered we are and how we make our decisions from being able to speak our truth and our boundaries in a loving yet true way, now that is the future generation that I want to see. So um, I believe that we can utilize media as medicine, just like you are doing, Debbie. Um, and we have an opportunity to utilize these platforms to be able to spread a message of empowerment for all beings. And my commitment through season three of the podcast is that it will do just that. Stay tuned. Thank you for the magic that you be blue. This has been extraordinary, like really goosebump time for me to hang out mm. with you. I'm grateful. Oh, I very much thoroughly enjoyed this conversation um, and you are such a fabulous host and you have instantly made me feel very at home and very at peace um, with this so I'm really grateful for everything that you're doing and for everybody that's listening thank you so much for tuning into this I hope you've extracted lots of gold and lots of, of yummy nuggets that you can be able to integrate into your life and um, and see how you can really sit with the question of what is your greatest challenge and how if through a new story can that also be your superpower beautiful New stories indeed. Well, I end this show with this quote from John Lennon. I believe in everything until it's disproved. So I believe in fairies, the myths and dragons. It all exists, even if it's in your mind. Who's to say that dreams and nightmares aren't as real as the here and now? Subscribe to this number one transformation conversation, the weekly Dare to Dream with Debbie Dashinger. Leave a comment and share. Send this to a friend and I read everything you write. Next week on the show, I'm featuring David Avocado Wolf, the well-known expert on eating raw, living foods, superfoods, super herbs, living water and health technology. It'll be a second time on the show. And thank you so much for joining us today. Remember to take a look at your stories and see what you need to let go of and rewrite because the world really needs the magic that you be. Mm.